The cross has the final word The cross has the final word Sorrow may come in the darkest night But the cross has the final word The cross has the final word The cross has the final word Evil may put its strongest fight But the cross has the final word The cross has the final word The Savior has come The morning light The cross has the final word The cross has the final word The cross family. TJ asked me to do this. I don't know why, but he asked me to do it. So here I am in your living room. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome to church today. We're glad to have you here. Um, I have some announcements I'm going to share. Tonight, the middle school and high school students are going to gather at TJ's house, and they're going to have a bonfire. That's at 6 p.m., and there's uh, details about that in an email. Uh, also, I want to mention the weekly prayer meeting that is at 9 o'clock each Tuesday. That's continuing. This week, we're going to add the element of being there physically together, if you're comfortable coming to the church and being there together physically. But it will be a physical prayer meeting together and a Zoom meeting at the same time. So if you want to participate by Zoom, it'll be the same Zoom link that's been used each week 
Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock. Speaking of Zoom, if you want to uh, use the Zoom's account, and we have it so that you can use for your care groups or for your Bible studies or whatever, um, we need some advance notice if you want to use it so that it can be coordinated. And the way to uh, give that advance notice is by sending an email to the office email address, which is office at berean.church. Office at berean.church. 48 hours or two days in advance, ask for use of the Zoom account. Now, we are going to get together again real soon, and God wants us to be together. Uh, I've enjoyed so much time with my family, I really have, and but I'm missing my time with my church family, and that's very, very important to me too. It's important to all of us. It's what God wants us to do, as I said. So 1030 on June 7, we're going to gather for church, and church only. Things are going to look different. Um, we're not going to have Sunday school. We won't have children's church. We won't have nursery. We won't pass the plate for an offering. And we won't have communion, at least for this first Sunday. We will have spacing. We'll have uh, every other row of chairs marked off. So that you will be sitting every other row. And we ask, we're going to be asking that you sit three chairs apart. You'll leave three empty chairs between each household group so that we have that kind of spacing horizontally. And then our speakers were going to be 12 feet in front of us as they lead us in singing and preaching and so on. George and TJ, whoever else is up there. We will be having a live streaming of the message. So if you are sick or if you are uh, been advised to stay home, then you should stay home and uh, you can participate online. Also, we're going to have an overflow space, overflow online streaming in the gym so that if a, uh, a young child needs a little time outside of the auditorium, they can be taken to the gym and the, the uh, service will be streamed in there. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's June 7. One more thing about that is that we really would like you to wear a mask. That's just going to make everybody else feel more comfortable. Some people are going to be, feel a lot more comfortable if they know that when I come to church, people are going to be wearing masks. So we ask you to bring your own mask, wear it. I've been wearing my mask to Walmart and Lowe's and Home Depot. I know it's uncomfortable. It's not what I prefer. And sometimes it seems uh, unnecessary. But this is what the, the officials have been advising us to do. And we want to honor that. And we also want to honor each other by wearing masks. So we're asking you to wear masks. If you don't have a mask, we're going to have a small stock. We're going to order about 50 masks and have them there. <coughs> Excuse me. So please do that. Join us on June 7th. And um, we'll be delighted to be together once again. I really miss you guys. I'm really glad to be with you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the fact that you've given us the blessing of church, that you uh, say that you uh, are working in the world through church. So we thank you for that. We ask you to bless our church, enable us to bless one another, enable us to bless our community, enable us to glorify you, give us ability to, to bless you through uh, our, our, the way we live, the way we communicate, the way we worship, the way we pray. Lord, we pray for this time today. We pray for George as he teaches us. We pray for our worship time together. We do look forward to seeing you, and we look forward to seeing each other. Amen. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, 
what depths of peace where fears are still when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I'll stand oh 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 there in the ground his body lay Light of the world by darkness slain and bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse is lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine Bought with the precious blood of Christ. Oh, 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 this is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Oh, 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 In Christ alone, when fears assails, when darkness falls, I find my peace in Christ alone. I give my life, I give my all, I sing my song to Christ alone. The King of kings, the Lord of all, our heaven sings. To Christ alone, to Christ alone, in Christ alone, till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ, we stand. This week, uh, when I was preparing for uh, worship this Sunday, I talked with Beth about doing uh, the song Heart of Worship. And it's a song that I know as a teenager, I remember listening to, and even before then, it's been out since early 90s. There's a song where Matt Redman wrote this song where they took music and they took uh, worship music and that stuff out of their church and for a season because they had gotten so comfortable uh, just in just the same old, same old. And he wanted to get back to the heart of worship. And they just sang a cappella for a few months uh, until they could get back to that in a routine at their church. And it was something that was great for them. And he wrote this song. You know, when the music fades, all is stripped away. Simply come. The lyrics that we all know. And I think that's so applicable to where we are today and where we are in this season of life. And when I look at um, Scripture, you know, we all know the story of the woman at the well, but I love what happens at the end. I want to read this to you guys this morning. 
Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. And so you, a lot of people read that. And say, what does that mean? What does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? And if you look at what she was talking about, she's sitting here saying, look, hey, Samaritans, we say that, God, we worship you on this mountain. And the Jews say you have to be here. And they're all tied up on where it is that they worship. And Jesus says, look, a time has now come. Lady, you don't know this, but you're right before the Messiah. And where you worship doesn't matter anymore. But how you worship and where your worship comes from, that's what matters from the spirit, not just the head of the matter, but the heart of the matter. And she's sitting right before our Messiah. And so today, when I think about singing the song, Heart of Worship, yes, I cannot wait till we get to rejoice and be back together in this building. And that's going to be a great day. But remember that whether you're in your home, sanctuary, grocery store, hospital, wherever it is, the kind of worshiper that the Father seeks is the one that worships in spirit and in truth, meaning from your heart, not where you're at, not even the position of your physical body, but the position of your heart. So we're going to sing a heart of worship that we've put together with a hymn as well that Beth has beautifully written and worked together with I Surrender All. When the music fades And all is swept away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the things I've made and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus Sorry, Lord, for the things I've made. But it's 
It's all about you. It's all about you. thank you. It is all about you. It's never stopped being about you, even though our eyes have gone away from that at times. It is all about you. So we make a decision as a church, as people, individuals, followers, disciples of Christ, that God, we want to come back to our first love. The only way that we know love, true love, and that's in you, Jesus Christ. So, God, I pray that you would convict us of that as we have time to meditate on this through these days of being home. I pray for George. God, as we dive into the book of James together, see our faith in action. God, that you convict us, challenge us. God, encourage us where we need it. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Berean. It's a glorious day today, and we're midway through our study in the book of James. Uh, I feel like, wow, this is going way too fast. I think we could have spent six months in James, but we are up to chapter three, and I'm looking forward to our time together this morning. I also have to admit I'm really looking forward to our time together, truthfully, uh, next Sunday in church again. That's going to be wonderful. So that's going to be an exciting time just to hear us sing and uh, be together. But this morning, uh, as we start, I just want to pray as we open up the Word of God uh, in the book of James. Father, thank you for your Word. It is living and powerful. Uh, Thank you that it transforms our lives, the truth that enters our heart. I pray you, Spirit of God, would just still our hearts and minds this morning. Help us to hear you speak to us, that we would not have distractions as we're at home. 
uh, that you would draw our hearts to you. And so we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the past few weeks, as we started into our study of James, James has walked us through a series of things that lead up to this morning. If you'll remember, he started out with his uh, book with talking about external trials and tribulations and how to deal with them. And then he moved into the internal struggle of dealing with temptation. So we went from suffering and trials and tribulations to temptation in the inner man and how do we address that and walk through that. And on the heels of that, he moved into the whole issue of, I don't want you just to be exposed to the Word of God. It's important that you are a doer of that Word. You, you do application because it's in that that there's real transformation. Exposure doesn't help. It is the doing of that that brings about the work of grace in our lives and transforms us in, into the image of Christ as we go along. And in that journey, he then steps us into a very practical application of when change is happening, how they would deal with the issue of prejudice within the body of Christ, since that was such a huge thing in the culture then, as it is in our culture today. Uh, and he talked about mercy triumphing over judgment, a judgmental spirit and heart. And then last week, he took us on this journey of, by the way, uh, it's important for you to know you, it's easy to say that you have faith, but in reality, that faith is not genuine if it's not married to works that come out of that. You might remember we talked about the illustration of Paul and James, and Paul talked about the fire in the fireplace, the real uh, work of the Spirit of God in uh, saving us. Uh, but when that work is real, James talks about the way that we really validate that is we see the smoke in the chimney, the works. So they go together, as we talked about the song last week, of a horse and carriage. You can't have one without the other. So we, we end chapter 2 on that, and we stepped into chapter 3 this morning where James wants to talk about the beast that, in fact, is in our body and how to control that. In his book entitled Killing Giants and Pulling Thorns, uh, Chuck Swindoll has reminded us of an epitaph that he heard about that was faintly edged on a tombstone uh, in the windswept hill of an English uh, church years ago. And it read like this, Beneath the stone, a lump of clay, lies Annabella Young, who on the 24th of May began to hold her tongue. Well, I think we all would admit that Annabella Young began to hold her tongue a bit too late for that to be on her epitaph. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, how true it is for us, the tongue and the power that it has. And this is where James is going to take us this morning. And I think it's just another practical snapshot of how he looks at various things going on in this young church that's beginning to spread and is separated out from Jerusalem and other places, plus the one there, and him both seeing at home in Jerusalem, but also hearing at uh, places of outside of Jerusalem that there are similar struggles that are going on. Uh, you think about it, can you name a muscle in your body that receives more exercise and has less control than the tongue? Medically, they say it's a two-inch slab of muscle with mucous membrane and nerves that helps us to chew and taste and swallow food and articulate words. But if we really non-technically talk about this in relational terms, what it really is is a two-ounce beast, at least sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it really is a beast that's within us. All through Scripture, uh, the Word of God speaks to this challenge that we all have as humanity. In Psalm 50, verse 19, it talks about sometimes this tongue frames deceit. It says, you give your mouth free reign for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. Uh, Psalm 52, 2, the tongue devises destruction. Your tongue plots destruction, he says there. In Psalm 52, 4, it's really a, a sharp sword. Uh, you love all words that devour, uh, O deceitful tongue. In uh, Proverbs 25, 23, uh, the writer there talks about a backbiting tongue. 
and it, that creates angry looks. Uh, Proverbs 28 talks about a flattering tongue. You know, the, whoever rebukes a man will afterwards receive favor than he who flatters with his tongue. So the tongue is described in many negative ways. Then the Apostle Paul comes along, and he really gets graphic and says in chapter 3 of Romans, in verse 13, speaking of evil people, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. So this is, uh, this is all through Scripture. The tongue is talked about in terms of how it's experienced. And, and what it reveals. And this is not a, either a new description for James. I mean, if you'll remember in James chapter 1 and verse 19, he says there, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak. There we go again, talking about our speech, the tongue, what's said. Uh, in verse 26 of chapter 1, he came along and he said, If anyone think, if you think you're religious, and you do not bridle your tongue, but deceive in your heart. Again, James comes back to this issue of what does the tongue show? And then in chapter 2, he comes and he says in verse 12, So speak and so act as those who are judged under the law of liberty. So even this description that we move into, here in James chapter 3. It's not a new topic for James. He has already stepped into this and described on more than one occasion his concern about the tongue and what the tongue can do and should not be doing and what, what we need to do as it relates to it. So James here in chapter 3, though, lashes with his pen the sometimes beastly nature of the tongue um, and the truth of his words Really, of all the writers of the New Testament, they don't, nothing cuts as deeply as these words at the first part of James chapter 3. But the real question you have to ask yourself is, is it really the literal tongue that is the problem, the real problem? And the answer is no. And James is going to get to this. It's not the literal tongue. James is really reflecting what he heard his brother Jesus talk about. Uh, I'm sure on many occasions, but we see it clearly in Matthew chapter 15, beginning with verse 10, where Jesus unmasked the real culprit that controls the tongue. Let's read that. Uh, verse 10 of Matthew 15, And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. And then skipping down to verse 17. Do you not see what, that whatever goes into the mouth pa passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what? defiles a person. So the reality is, the tongue is neither a friend or a foe. It is merely a messenger that delivers the dictates of a desperately sick heart. Or, I could also say, it is the messenger that delivers healing of a spirit-filled so every time that Jesus, or James, uses the word tongue in this passage, I want you to think heart. Because really, if we were to go back to last week talking about the fire and the chimney, the tongue is the smoke coming out of the chimney, revealing the fire, or the heart in this case, that Jesus talked about. So the tongue is an expression of what is, in fact, actually there. So as we look into the passage this morning, when it refers to or mentions the tongue in one way or the other, I want you to be thinking heart. But let's dive into the passage a bit. Verse 1 of chapter 3 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a stricter 
or a greater strictness. Um, so the question is, is James condemning the teaching ministry? And no, he's not. Actually, what he's warning against is people clamoring for the position without really weighing the cost that comes with that. James really, I think, is aiming his words at warning those who I would call wannabe teachers. Uh, I believe James is primarily speaking to those who want to teach, who assert themselves as teachers in this young church that's spread all over the place, and yet they should not be teachers. I think that's what he's addressing. I think James was hearing uh, about this that was happening. Uh, Paul also warned of this in his letters, and James wants to speak directly to that. This subject of the teachers is really just illustrative of an underlying thing of the tongue and the power of its influence and underlying that, the motivations of the heart. So I want to consider why James would see this as a very serious problem and why what seems a little weird to start out with teachers when you're talking about the tongue really is not weird at all. It actually fits with where James is going and trying to train and teach this young group of believers in the region truth. Um, he thought it was a problem, first of all, because here's what happens. Adversity seems to attract many counselors and advisors who wish to instruct us as to why we're suffering. All you have to do is go back to the book of Job to see his three friends and how they came along and gave their opinions about the reason he was suffering was unconfessed sin. Uh, in the end, God rebukes those three counselors, teachers, advisors, whatever you want to call them, uh, because the reality was what they were communicating, Job, was not true of what God was thinking. Many are the words of counsel and advice when we are suffering some kind of adversity. But I think those advisors and counselors should really take to heart this verse 1 and heed the warning that James gives here uh, because it is a serious thing to step into the context of adversity and suffering and give opinion. It's a serious thing. Secondly, James, I think, speaks to this issue of not many of you should become teachers because there will always be those who really seek to be teachers in order to promote their own flesh, their own interest. In Acts 20, Paul actually addresses this in warning the church, the elders at the church of Ephesus, of uh, what was going to happen in uh, Acts 20, verse 30. He says, e even from among your own group, men will arise teaching perversions of the truth to draw the disciples away after them. So Paul's saying, look, there are going to be people that rise up claiming to be teachers, but their motivation is really the praise of men and the following and the adrenaline rush and the energy they get from influence. But it's not for righteous purposes at all. And this is a concern for James. And I think it was part of why he says what he says here. And lastly, the third reason I think James starts out with this issue of warning about being a teacher is this particular problem just within the culture of wannabe teachers. Remember that at this time, you have, in fact, scribes and Pharisees who walk around and it describes them in very clear terms in Matthew 23, uh, where it says they, speaking of the scribes and Pharisees, love the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues. You remember when we talked about prejudice, and James writes about that in James 2. He talked about the rich man and the poor man coming in and how you'd set the rich man in the place of honor in the synagogue. This is what he's talking about. Well, these, these scribes and Pharisees like the place of honor at banquets, like the best seats in the synagogue. And then he says in verse 7 of Matthew 23, and they like elaborate greetings in the marketplace and to have people call them rabbi or teacher. So there's this, there's this problem within the church, I think, that James sees where they're mimicking the temptation of the flesh to want to have honor by being the teacher. 
uh, much like what they've observed in their culture with scribes and Pharisees. Now, the word teacher appears 58 times in the New Testament, and the majority of those are in reference to Jesus, 48 times. But Paul also references this idea uh, in 1 Corinthians 12 when he re lists the uh, different offices and different giftings, and he lists apostles, prophets, and the third ranking there is teachers. So this is an influential, important role within the body of Christ. I think we have to be careful to make distinctions between apostles, prophets, and teachers because the Scripture actually does that. In Ephesians 4.11, uh, Paul, Paul writes and says, pastors and teachers. Um, the point being that there's different roles, although a pastor can be a teacher as well. In Acts chapter uh, uh, 13, uh, it's referenced there as far as prophets and teachers. So teachers are mentioned often that function, that calling, that gifting uh, in a high place of influence, but also of responsibility. And this is why I think James speaks to the notion of a stricter judgment. Uh, the cost of assuming this role uh, is because there is, in fact, something here that has to be addressed related to the responsibility of that office of a teacher, that role, because of influence. Um, this isn't about just sharing our opinions. If God puts you in a place of opening up the living Word of God and explaining it to people, uh, it's not about your opinions, it's God's truth. Because the words that teachers sow will affect many people. In fact, oftentimes will affect generations. But not only that, it's not just what we teach, but there's also the responsibility that we have to walk what we talk because of the influence, because of the fact that of the trust that people put on us if we are entrusted with teaching the Word of God, this can't be like the Pharisees and be hypocrites where we teach this law but live a different way necessarily. We are expected to walk out what we're talking, what we're teaching. There's a, there's a stricter judgment because the influence can be destructive if, in fact, people are observing us, trusting that our lives are modeling the life of Christ, and then there's this disconnect between what we say and how we live. Uh, James explains it this way in beginning in verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. I think this especially applies to teachers. Since no one is infallible, I know I'm certainly not. And since the tongue is really the tool, the, the tool of the trade for teachers, then a teachers must master the use of that tool to avoid stumbling into a stricter judgment. Uh, this is a, the, a critical, critical thing. I want to, in your notes, if you got those and I've printed them off, one of the things I have there is the, the clarification. And this is a clarification I want to make because some people might ask this. So are you saying that James is saying um, that no one should teach because it just gets you in trouble. James is not condemning teaching in any way here. I want to clarify that. He's not. He is, I think, prom not either promoting silence. It's not that he's saying you, you don't need to say anything, you should never teach, those are bad things. James is not saying either of those things. He's not uh, condemning teaching. He's not promoting silence. I think what he is proposing is control, control of the tongue, which translates into the control of our heart by having the fruit of the spirit of self-control. I think that's where James is going, the wisdom and uh, the work of grace in our heart for self-control so that our tongue is under control because of this greater responsibility of influence, but also the greater responsibility to teach the word correctly and not just give uh, my own opinion at the disregard of, of what the Spirit of God is doing. 
Now, what he does to try to give a, a, a notion of the bigger issue, teaching is kind of an example, but it's a big one because in his context and what was going on, I think he felt like, I really need to address this problem that's creeping up in the churches, as Paul had indicated to the elders at Ephesus. But bigger than that, he wants to talk about the underlying problem that isn't just about people who are teachers, it's about people. And that this, I think he saw, as we see today in our own lives, in Berean, in the culture as a whole. And that is the issue, the tongue itself. And so James now, in verse 3 through 5, emphasizes the power of the tongue through three illustrations. And let's look at those beginning in verse 3. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. So James starts out and he says, you know, just with a length of rope and a few strips of leather and a little piece of metal in the horse's mouth, a rider can control the entire horse's body. This powerful animal that's way stronger than any man can be completely controlled with this bit in the horse's mouth. That's how powerful that small piece of metal and that rope and leather stripes can be. It's powerful enough, as small as it is, to control this massively strong animal. Then he moves to a second illustration in verse 4. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. I don't think James was a sailor, and I know he did, they, in that day and time they did not have the massive, humongous cargo ships that we have today, but they had large ships. And James understood the notion of this huge, huge ship. The direction of it is completely dictated by this small, small rudder in comparison to the remainder of this massive built boat. And his point was being that the rudder of the human body is this little slab of muscle we call the tongue. Horses, ships. And now James moves to his most extreme analogy in verse 5. Let's look at that, where he talks about fire. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. A tiny spark, not the size of our fingernail, holds the, the power to destroy thousands and thousands of acres of forest, James says. I don't know if you remember this, and uh, uh, most of you probably will remember, uh, four years ago in November, a foolish high school boy from Oak Ridge on the top of the chimneys lit a blade of grass or a little bit of wood or something, and out of that became this raging inferno that consumed the Smoky Mountains and part of the city of Gatlinburg, uh, killed 14 people, injured 190 people, did uh, half a billion dollars of damage, destroyed over 2,400 structures, and burnt over 17,000 acres. This one little spark on the top of the chimneys. So, such is the power of the tongue, James is pointing out. Uh, I remember watching the videos of people driving off the mountain in the night and the, and the forest just raging fire everywhere, hoping they would get out alive and, and, and remember thinking about, reflecting about how incredibly fast and scary and consuming that fire was that started from this little spark. And James says the tongue is that consuming, that destructive, potentially. Here's the beautiful thing, though. Just as true as the tongue can be that destructive, so it is true that the tongue has the potential to be that healing, that wonderful. Uh, my wife Judy shared with me a quote that she read this week. I thought, wow, this, this, is, uh, this is so helpful in balancing and understanding the difference between out-of-control flesh and the beauty of the control of the spirit within our hearts and how the tongue expresses that. Mother Teresa was quoted as saying, 
Kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless. I thought, wow, how true it is that the, the tongue is, is uh, not a friend or a foe. And it can be a tool for healing, a tool for building up, or it can be incredibly destructive when it's out of control and wreck havoc in our lives. So James starts out, and it's my first point I think that James makes is the tongue is small but powerful. And in your notes, that's the first point. The tongue is small, but it is powerful. It is very powerful. It controls the direction of our lives, so like the bit in the horse's mouth. It turns us right or left like the rudder on the boat. It can be great healing or it can be enormous destruction, just like the fire he talks about in verse 5. But he wants to elaborate on that last part of verse 5. And so he comes into verse 6 and he elaborates on the verse 5 image. And he says in verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. Some versions will say a world of iniquity or of evil. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. I like what the message, how the writer of the message put it. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony into chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it, Smoke right from the pit of hell. These are graphic words that James is using here. He doesn't mince words uh, or his metaphors when he uses this. I want you to notice the phrase, a world of unrighteousness, or maybe your version says a world of iniquity or evil. James means that the whole world of evil finds its expression through the tongue. Boastful pride destructive anger, uh, cluttering, uh, bitterness that cuts to the heart of people, uh, flattering, lustful words that are manipulative and drawing. All of that is communicated through the tongue. But there's an interesting thing that I, James throws in here that I think is worth seeing that we don't see so much in the English translation. When it says, and is set on fire by hell, right at the very end of verse 6, um, instead of the familiar term, which is Hades, James actually chooses the term to point out his uh, issue of what this really represents. He uses Gehenna. And Gehenna was an actual valley outside of Jerusalem, which was actually the garbage dump. All the filth of the city of Jerusalem accumulated there in Gehenna. And I think James's point is, in all the filth and evil of our sinful hearts accumulates on our tongue. We need to think about that. What is, what is my tongue, what has my tongue in the last week revealed about what's accumulating in my heart? I think that's James's point. But he goes on. He changes the images in the next two verses. In verse 7, uh, he says, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. I remember growing up and the P.T. Barnum and Ringling Brother Circus came to Knoxville. I remember being taken and I, re I remember watching the uh, lions and the tigers and the bears and the elephants and, and how uh, they were trained and what they did. And um, if you've ever seen that, then you're seeing the truth of what James is talking about here. We know how to train them. I think of Gentle Ben and Flipper and Shamu and Lassie that growing up we saw on TV animals that were trained to act and do certain things. But there's one beast James is pointing out here that P.T. Barnum cannot train, and that is the tongue. And just then, with a flicker of a shudder, James changes again a third and final picture at the end of verse 8. Uh, when he 
brings out this whole thing of uh, uh, the tongue, and he he points out a, a an interesting thing, and that is that this tongue, even though it is necessary, I mean we have to have it to eat, we have to have it to talk, it's necessary, but his point is it is dangerous. It is very, very, very dangerous. And uh, I would say, not only then are we, just James saying, it's small but powerful. But it is, it is necessary, but it is very dangerous. So then, thirdly, he steps into verse 9 and he says, the tongue is helpful, but it is inconsistent. Look at what he points out. It's powerful. It's a dangerous beast, but remember that at the beginning of this morning I said it sometimes is bad. But the tongue is inconsistent because the heart is divided. And remember, the tongue is reflecting what is resident in our heart. So sometimes James points out that it can be evil and sometimes it can be good. And he gives us this picture of a doc, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde picture here in verse 9. He says, with it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers. These things ought not to be so. We wouldn't disagree with that. We should not bless and curse, but we do. They are so. There's an illustration that I read that I think kind of points out how this actually plays out in day-to-day -day living. Uh, once a large family sat around a table for breakfast one morning, and as was the custom, the father would return thanks, uh, blessing God for the food. But immediately after, he would begin to uh, grumble, as was his bad habit, and he would grumble about the quality of the food and how it was prepared and uh, the hard times they were having, and just grumble, grumble, grumble about more and more stuff. And in the process of that one day, his daughter interrupted him and said, Father, do you suppose that God remembered what you said in her a little while ago? And uh, the father said, well, of course he does. Certainly he does with a confident air of being an instructor or a teacher. And then she said, uh, well, do you think he heard what you said about the bacon and the coffee? Well, certainly, the father said, but not quite as confidently now. And then the little girl asked him, Well, then, Father, which did God believe? The blessing, obviously, or the grumbling? And the answer, of course, is both. <laughs> both. Because it revealed the real condition of the human heart, of that father's heart. And what James does at this point, he shows the nature of the human heart and that it's nothing like anything outside of the human heart in nature. Look at verse 11. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? You remember last week I talked about in Greek, the way that questions can be framed within the language of, of Koine Greek. As you read it, you can know what the answer is going to be. And this is another example of where James does that. The way it's constructed, we know the answer is no, it can't. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Again, no, we know that. Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Unlike humankind, nature is consistent. Peach trees don't produce poisonous mushrooms. Nature is always consistent. Only the human heart is capable of producing such incredible inconsistencies as blessing and cursing almost simultaneously in the same context. So James really is coming at giving illustrations here to his church to say, I want you to understand the power of how the tongue defiles, how it directs, 
how it can be destructive or healing, how it, how it maneuvers where your life's going to end up if you're not careful. I want you to understand the dividedness that it demonstrates uh, in your life by what comes out of your mouth, blessing and cursing. I want you to see this is no small issue that the t we talk about when we talk about our speech and the tongue. So here uh, this morning are three applications I want to share with you, just three simple statements concerning the tongue that I think we can take out of this passage of James 3, uh, truths that we should remember. Number one, the tongue defiles. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 15, that it is actually the heart which is defiled. The tongue is the smoke. It represents what's in the heart. But when that speech comes out, it defiles. Not only me, but it is destructive and defiles the things around me. The tongue defiles. The second thing is the tongue defies. It defies every attempt at human control. The flesh wars against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, Paul says in Galatians. And that battle, that warring, that is reflected in our speech and the power of the tongue and control. How often I have found myself sitting in the context of a conversation or somebody saying something, and everything in me wants to say something, everything in me. And the only reason that I wouldn't would be the power of the Spirit of God because my flesh is, is defying control. It wants to say what it wants to say. The tongue defies control apart from the supernatural work of the Spirit of God. So it defiles, it defies control, and then lastly, it displays. The tongue displays who you really are. What is in your heart? Justin, who was an early church father, once said, by examining the tongue, Physicians find out the diseases of the body, and philosophers the diseases of the mind and the heart. So I went to the doctor the other day, and you know how this is. You go, you go for your annual checkup, and they take a tongue suppressor, and they say, stick your tongue out, say, ah, and they put the suppressor down to look down your throat. So I would say to you this morning, open your mouth, stick out your tongue, and say, ah. Hmm. My imagine is your tongue looks healthy. But what has it revealed about your heart this past week? Think about that. Remember, it is powerful. Even though it's small, it's powerful. Even though it's necessary, it can be dangerous. Even though it is helpful, it is very inconsistent. And only by the incredible grace of God and his enabling power is that beast that's in our body brought under control and used for the glory of God as opposed for the destruction of people around us. Slander, gossip, cursing, no unwholesome word, Paul says in Ephesians 4, should proceed out of our mouth. But only that is fitting for the building up of people. May I ask you, take time today and reflect on the past week and ask the Spirit of God, what has my speech revealed about what is in my heart? in arrogance, in pride, in jealousy, in bitterness, in anger. Those things come out in our words. James is saying, this is so important to understand within our relationships as believers that our tongue is controlled by a heart that is submitted to the Spirit of God and thus enabling us to have the power to use that instrument, our tongue, for healing and building up and encouraging 
and not tearing down. May God grant us the grace and the courage to look, to consider, and to obey the Lord and submit to the Lord these areas of our lives that the tongue is revealing need his healing touch and need our repentance. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage. Graphic, uh, convicting. Give us the courage not to just gloss over this and say, oh, well, that was interesting and move on, but to really wait before you and ask you, purify our hearts, O oh Lord, that our speech would be righteous and healthy and healing and glorifying to you and building up a people and not used of darkness to tear down and wound and destroy. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to give us the capacity to have self-control. We praise you, Lord Jesus, and ask you, meet us in this space in our heart that we might bring you delight with our speech. In Jesus' name, amen.